and welcome back to my vlog. I'm outside. It's in the 30s, but after a couple days last week below zero, it feels rather balmy. I'm probably going to record a couple today, three, maybe four if I can, depending on how much light I have and battery in my camera. <clears throat> Enough of that. On with the adventures of Colonel Daniel Boone, part five. We left them anticipating an attack on Boonesboro. About the 1st of August, I made an incursion into the Indian country with a party of 19 men in order to surprise a small town up Siotha called Paint Creek Town. We advanced within four miles thereof where we met a party of 30 Indians on their march against Boonesboro, intending to join the others from Chillicothe. A smart fight ensued betwixt us for some time. At length, the savages gave way and fled. We had no loss on our side. The enemy had one killed and two wounded. We took from them three horses and all their baggage, and being informed by two of our number that went to their town that the Indians had entirely evacuated it, we proceeded no further and returned with all possible expedition to assist our garrison against the other party. We passed by them on the sixth day, and on the seventh, we arrived safe at Boonesboro. On the eighth, the Indian army arrived, being 444 in number, commanded by Captain Duquesne, 11 other Frenchmen, and some of their own chiefs, and marched up within view of our fort, with British and French colors flying. And having sent a summons to me in His Britannic Majesty's name to surrender the fort, I requested two days' consideration, which was granted. It was now a critical period with us. We were a small number in the garrison, a powerful army before our walls, whose appearance proclaimed inevitable death, fearfully painted and marking their footsteps with desolation. Death was preferable to captivity, and if taken by storm, we must inevitably be devoted to destruction. In this situation, we concluded to maintain our garrison if possible. We immediately proceeded to collect what we could of our horses and other cattle and bring them through the posterns into the fort. And in the evening of the 9th, I returned answer that we were determined to defend our fort while a man was living. Now, said I to their commander, who stood attentively hearing my sentiments, we laugh at all your formidable preparations, but thank you for giving notice and time to provide for our defense. Your efforts will not prevail, for our gates shall forever deny you admittance. Whether this answer affected their courage or not, I cannot tell, but contrary to our expectations, they formed a scheme to deceive us, declaring it was their orders from Governor Hamilton to take us captives and not to destroy us. But if nine of us would come out and treat, the, treat with them, they would immediately withdraw their forces from our walls and return home peaceably. This sounded grateful in our ears, and we agreed to the proposal. We held the treaty within 60 yards of the garrison on purpose to divert them from a breach of honor as we could not avoid suspicions of the savages. In this situation, the articles were formally agreed to and signed, and the Indians told us it was customary with them on such occasions for two Indians to shake hands with every white man in the treaty as an evidence of entire friendship. We agreed to this also, but were soon convinced their policy was to take us prisoners. They immediately grappled us, but although surrounded by hundreds of savages, we extricated ourselves from them and escaped all safe into the garrison, except one that was wounded through a heavy fire from their army. They immediately attacked us on every side, and a constant heavy fire ensued between us day and night for the space of nine days. In this time, the enemy began to undermine our fort, which was situated 60 yards from Kentucky River. They began at the watermark and proceeded in the bank some distance, which we understood by their marking, making the water muddy with the clay, and we immediately proceeded to disappoint their design by cutting a trench across their subterranean passage. The enemy, discovering our countermine by the clay we threw out of the fort, desisted from that stratagem, an experience now fully convincing them that neither their power nor policy could affect their purpose. On the 20th day of August, they raised the siege and departed. During this dreadful siege, which threatened death in every form, we had two men killed and four wounded, besides a number of cattle. We killed of the enemy 37 and wounded a great number. After they were gone, we picked up 125 pounds weight of bullets, 
besides what's stuck in the logs of our fort, which certainly is a great proof of their industry. Soon after this, I went into the settlement, and nothing worthy of a place in this account passed in my affairs for some time. During my absence from Kentucky, Colonel Bowman carried on an expedition against the Shawanese at Old Chillicothe with 160 men in July 1779. Here they arrived undiscovered, and a battle ensued, which lasted until 10 o'clock a.m., when Colonel Bowman, finding he could not succeed at this time, retreated about 30 miles. The Indians, in the meantime, collecting all their forces, pursued and overtook him. When a smart fight continued near two hours, not to the advantage of Colonel Bowman's party. Colonel Herod proposed to mount a number of horse and furiously to rush upon the savages who at this time fought with remarkable fury. This desperate step had a happy effect, broke their line of battle, and the savages fled on all sides. In these two battles, we had nine killed and one wounded. The enemy's loss uncertain, only two scalps being taken. So, now we find that it wasn't just Indians who took scalps. More tomorrow about Daniel Boone and the Kentucky Wars. Make it a great day, and bye for now.